Yes, please, sir. Yes. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our second series of CMA webinar on uh, how the uh, recent exchange rate fluctuation affects the uh, different different industries. So, as you know, CMA Sri Lanka is the national management accounting body incorporated by an act of parliament. And she is also, CMA Sri Lanka is also a member of SAFA and IFAC member. So without taking uh, much time, since we are behind schedule, I would like to invite our founder chairman, Professor Lakshmanar Bhattavala to do the first session. Over to you, Professor. Okay. Uh, thank you, Adrian. Uh, good evening to uh, all our speakers, panelists, and of course our moderator and uh, all our participants uh, to our uh, webinar on the impact of foreign exchange fluctuations on costing and pricing of products and services. Now, this is the second uh, uh, seminar that we are conducting and the first one uh, which we had last week. And uh, there were some uh, where we discussed some of the sectors and today uh, uh, the, the sectors that were left out uh, which we are taking into uh, account. Uh, so we have, uh, of course, our uh, Professor Sirimavan Kolombage has a problem on the connection. So he will not be able to come in, but we will have uh, uh, Mr. Mahendra Jayasekara, who is uh, the chairman of the Cost and Management Accounting Standards Board of uh, CMA uh, to speak to us on the managerial costing and societal costing. Uh, framework which has been just launched by uh, CMA Sri Lanka. Uh, and then, of course, we have a very, very uh, uh, knowledgeable and eminent panel of uh, panel who will be there. I'm sure Mr. Uh, Adrian Perra, who is the moderator, uh, would uh, introduce them uh, once we start the session. So, uh, 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 just a few uh, things on the last time's uh, uh, webinar that we had, it was also on the same topic. There were some important matters uh, that came up, you know. Uh, one was really the problem that was there as a result of the uh, the uh, cost going up and, of course, the variation in the prices that was happening. And there were two industries uh, that were especially there that were relating to the export industry, the apparel industry and uh, the hotel industry or the hospitality industry. And uh, both parties said that they were billing their customers in US dollars. So as a result that uh, the uh, variation in the costs that were happening were uh, not very great to them, uh, especially in the apparel sector, of course they have the imports, they have the dollar accounts, and then the only impact that they uh, said this would be the wages uh, that uh, may, which may go up as a result of uh, the uh, increasing prices that are uh, happening. And then, of course, the inflation, uh, which is also going uh, very high and which will result in uh, maybe the, again, the increase in the wages that will happen. Uh, then they, there was the construction industry and uh, they were really having uh, major problems, but they said that they, will, they are quoting in dollars, but of course, no payment in dollars but uh, uh, the dollar rate to be converted into rupees as a result, because the cement is going up, the uh, steel is going up at different, different times. So they said that uh, with that, uh, they are able to do the manager, uh, manage the prices that they are quoting. And then do it. so I think those were two uh, major areas uh, which uh, came up for discussion and uh, which were taken up. So, uh, the uh, other area, of course, was the pharmaceutical industry, where they were having uh, uh, problems on the uh, uh, pricing as a result of the uh, foreign exchange fluctuation, because most of the items are imported. So as a result, uh, there, were, there, there is a problem on the pricing. Plus also, if the prices, uh, the, if the government is controlling the prices, then they will find that uh, uh, there were shortages. I think there were certain shortages on certain items as a result of this, but uh, I think those had been corrected and then uh, where the imports are coming in. Then the other one, of course, was the retail trade. The retail trade where they mentioned that, uh, again, the uh, increase in the prices, especially the 
agricultural products, the community have been, of course, the imported products. Now, a lot of them have been banned, but they said that they will be able to use the local uh, materials that will come up. So there is opportunity for the local industries to come in. Then the transport sector, uh, I'm, I'm indeed happy that uh, our Professor Amal Kumarge, who was, he was away in uh, Bangladesh, but he connected and he uh, really mentioned that uh, one of the biggest imports that we are having is the coal. So if we are really going, if we are going to cut down the uh, the usage of fuel, then we need to go for more public transport. So he, I think what he said was correct, rather than uh, running private vehicles to go for public transport. And he mentioned that uh, we need to give priority for the public transport rather than go to uh, put up uh, the new highways. So this is something that uh, I think uh, brings sense. Because if you are able to increase the public transport, that means more passengers can go in it and uh, the use of private vehicles will be short. So that's uh, one area that uh, one thing that was told. And of course, it also has a direct relationship to the major imports that are coming in, which is the uh, uh, petroleum sector. And today, uh, if you look at uh, the problems that we are having, the uh, uh, various places, the uh, one thing is the queues that are uh, developed and of course the gas, uh, these are two sectors where uh, the, the foreign exchange situation has badly hit. Uh, but now the government has uh, negotiated for certain loans uh, uh, from India and they are hoping that uh, uh, in this regard the, uh, the uh, uh, fuel uh, problem would be uh, uh, maybe uh, for a short time, they will be able to get uh, rid of this. But we need to see if you are taking the loans, uh, we also need to work out a method by which we are going to repay the loan. So that's uh, uh, something that uh, government has also now uh, uh, called all party conference and they were discussing it. And uh, it was mentioned yesterday uh, that uh, they are planning to go to the IMF. Now, uh, that is, uh, earlier they were denying it, but now they have agreed uh, that we should go to IMF, but going to IMF means uh, we need to uh, make a lot of preparations from our side uh, as to how we are going to run the economy. Today, I think uh, I just saw in the news that uh, they are going to increase the train prices, so they will increase the petrol prices. Of course, these are all what the, uh, uh, the uh, 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 what will be said uh, by the IMF, because they will say that uh, we need to do it, but uh, that's where this our uh, cost and management accounting would come in, you know, because uh, the pricing and costing, because costing is an area where efficiency and productivity will be improved, because otherwise you will never be able to uh, uh, compete in a foreign market. So uh, the costing and the, the societal costing is what the society has to pay. So the society pay for inefficiency, especially in the uh, cooperation sector, uh, should they pay for inefficiencies, the uh, excess staff that is there. So these are things that uh, should have to be uh, uh, maybe corrected and uh, the societal costing and the managerial costing uh, has to be uh, taken into account if we are really going to do that. So uh, uh, one of the most important things is uh, that, but also we need to have a, a proper governance structure also in place. I just want to maybe uh, talk, uh, 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 read a few things on the governance itself, uh, where we can, uh, where we say strong and effective corporate governance helps to cultivate a company culture of integrity. Now that's the other important thing of integrity leading to a positive performance and a sustainable business overall. Now, sustainability is the most important thing. And today, in this very, very uh, difficult situation, in this crisis situation, we need to see how we can sustain ourselves. Essentially, it exists to increase the accountability of all the individuals. Now, accountability is something that people, uh, we have not exercised. There is a lot of inefficiency, a uh, lot of wrong things being done, but no one is accountable. So if you know in the private sector, uh, everyone is accountable. If you do the wrong thing, then I'm sure the, not only will you be taken to task, but uh, doors will be open 
where you have to go out. But in the public sector, even at the very, very high levels, accountability, they always say, okay, if there's a loss, the government will pay. But who is accountable for it? Now, that's a very, very important area. And I'm sure the IMF will make all these people accountable. And that's why they were scared in going to the IMF. But now they have to go to IMF. And uh, that's something that uh, where organizations and uh, that will also uh, help to avoid mistakes. Now, that's why we, have, we need professional management to avoid mistakes. Now, where we have professional management, we will be able to do. Because, you see, uh, we know that uh, I will just like to read, uh, because now our uh, minister had gone to see the, the Honorable Prime Minister in India. But I just want to read something on, on the Economic Advisory Council to the Prime Minister in India. Now, these are areas where we should get advice. The Economic Advisory Council to the Prime Minister is an independent body constituted to give advice on economic and related issues to the government of India, specifically to the Prime Minister. At present, the composition of the Economic Advisory Council is Dr. Bibek Debroy, Chairman, a very, very leading economist. Sri Rakesh Mohan is a part-time member of the economy. So these are people who will be there to build the economy. So I think uh, we need to take some advice uh, from India uh, and as to how not only can we take the loans, but how we can manage our economy. So now that's a very, very good exercise, you know, because I'm just talking because today we have uh, some, uh, how many universities we have? We have, I think, uh, uh, the Columbia University was now about 100 to 150 years. Don't they have any uh, good economies that they have produced? It's a very sh big shame for our country. You know, if you do not have top economies, I think there are top economies. One economist was uh, gone on the central bank. I'm sure the similar type, there are so many economies. So I think uh, our universities would have produced top economies who can help the government, you know. So they will be able to give independent opinions as to how the economy could be developed, not maybe private businesses or my own business or whatever it is. It has to be, you have to think of the country as a whole. So I think uh, we need to take good advice. Then the other thing is we need to see how we can uh, maybe uh, looking at India because now that they are getting loans, I just want to tell that now they give education, higher education to everyone. In Sri Lanka, we have 160,000 passing, only 35,000. So there, they have the solution, you know. It's not free education, but it's affordable education where the public and the private sector work together and they give this education. If you take Pune University, the Pune University has, uh, it's a government university, it has 600 colleges and 600,000 students. So one university can cover the whole of what we need of 100,000, 160,000. So I think we must take advice, uh, good advice from uh, the Indian uh, government, maybe from the Indian ministers, and then see how uh, this could be done. So these are two things that I thought that I should tell you. And of course, the professionals, the professionals in this country, we have so many professionals. Even from 48, we had the best, the best civil service in South Asia, not South Asia, in Asia, not South Asia, in Asia. Today, where are we? We are really at the bottom. Now, the other thing that I want to tell you is with the depreciation of the currency, we are, our per capita income is going down. It will go down to an extent that we will be a developing country or whatever it is, but not uh, in the current state that we are. So are we going to that state? Because if we go to that state, we are going to enjoy a lot of benefits. What happened was uh, when we uh, went high at a higher level, we lost all the benefits, all the GSP facilities that we were enjoying. It all went to Bangladesh, where even our garment industry, where people went there and opened up. So I, are we going to come down to a lower level so that we will get more benefits in the uh, export marketing where the GSP and other facilities are going to give us? So these are things that we need to consider. And I think uh, this is going to be a turning point in the history of Sri Lanka. The crisis situation has come in, but the private sector is one that can build. The public and private sector, we must always go for public and private sector so that we can build this country. So today we have a very, very eminent panel. 
they will be able to speak to us. I have also invited from the public sector, Mr. Jayasekara, who's a member of our institute, a member on the council. He is chairman of the state printing corporation. Today, the exams have been canceled because there is no printing paper. It's not that the print paper is not available, but the government can't pay to buy that paper that is outside. But also it may not be available. So I think uh, we need to take a new turn on this whole thing. We need to tell people what has to be done. The politicians must listen to the private sector and see what is required for this country and then do it. Use the professionals, use the technocrats. That's how this country can be. So I'm sure that uh, our series of seminars will tell the government and the others as to what could be done to build this country. Today, we are in a very, very difficult situation. Various rumors going, which will also be very, very damaging. So we need to see how we can contain it. And I think if they work with the private sector, get their support, I'm sure that a lot of these things will go because even institutions such as the IMF will want them to come. It does not mean uh, private, uh, the privatization. We need good management. If all this, uh, what was said in the last budget, the, the cutting down of expenditure of the government departments, the restructuring of the SOEs, the KPIs for the government departments, every quarter to give a statement. Nothing was done, you know. So what is the use? Then maybe we need the IMF to come and tell government, if you don't do this, we won't give you the money. That's what will happen, you know. So I think we need to take a new turn. We need to be determined. And we can, from the private sector, uh, work with the government and help them to come out of this crisis. Thank you and all the best. Okay, uh, Adrian, can't hear you, can't hear you. Can you hear me now, Professor? Yeah, yeah, okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, without, uh, thank you, Professor, without taking much time, I would like to invite Mahendra Jayasekara, uh, Managing Director and CEO of uh, Lanka Tires Limited, CLC, and Chairman of uh, CMA Sri Lanka, the management accounting standard board to emphasize especially on the management accounting standards and social societal uh, costing over to you mahendra yeah thank you uh, adrian good evening to everyone including uh, the founder president of cma professor watavada in fact after listening to professor watavada i have a loss uh, to decide where to start of course, uh, my topic is uh, managerial and societal costing framework and its importance in the current uh, uh, situation. Just to give you uh, uh, a brief background uh, to the managerial and uh, uh, cost accounting framework we issued on the 28th of October. Actually, uh, as you may be perhaps aware, this uh, Cost and Management Accounting Standard Board was set up in 2016 under the uh, the, of, uh, the Institute of uh, Certified Management Accountants of Sri Lanka. And uh, the purpose of uh, the Cost and Manage Management Accounting Standard Board uh, is to uh, come up with the costing standards uh, for Sri Lanka because, as you know, we have accounting standards, financial accounting standards, uh, uh, that are in place, uh, that, that is a part of our uh, law, law of the land, but we don't have cost accounting standards. There are many countries now have cost accounting standards that define uh, and regulate how cost records should be kept by uh, economic enterprises and also how different costs should be treated. So as the first step towards issuing accounting standards, the accounting standard board, the cost and management accounting standard board, uh, issued this framework, uh, uh, what we call the exposure draft on the 28th of October, 2021, that was last year. And it is open for public debate now. And we'll be basically considering the public views before we finalize the, the exposure draft and, and issue uh, the framework as a, as a policy document. Thereafter, we will issue guidelines uh, as to how uh, different costs uh, uh, different costs should be treated and uh, 
and uh, how different uh, costs should be apportioned and it will be basically uh, dealing with all aspects of uh, cost accounting and we will come up with a, a set of standards that will regulate and give an insight into, into uh, how different costs should be treated uh, uh, across the board by all uh, participants in the economy. Now, just to drive home, uh, actually I need to uh, speak a few words about uh, the importance of societal costing because of the professor uh, in his opening re remarks emphasized the importance of uh, keeping uh, uh, or the importance of having an idea uh, about the, the cost incurred by economic enterprises that provide these services. And as you know, in Sri Lanka, the structure of the economy is such that the state plays a very big role in countries' main economic activities than in most developed uh, countries. Now, if you take almost all our key economic sectors, such as health, education, water, electricity, gas, petroleum, railways, airlines, seaports, they are all in the hands of the state. Now, I, I think these sectors account for good 40 to 50 percent of the total economic activity uh, in the country, and they account for a, a big slice of the GDP. Now, just talking about uh, the the uh, the role these enterprises play uh, in the economy. Now. If you really see the, the recent development, if you take la not recent, actually last 30, 40 years uh, of our economic performance, what we can see is that all these services provided by the government were consumed by the, the consumers or, or, or probably uh, citizens of the citizens as well as residents of this country without knowing the cost at which these services uh, are produced by the government or offered by the government. And what the government consistently and constantly failed to do was to, to get the, uh, the users of these products and services to pay the economic cost of these products and services. And as a result, what has happened is over the last three to four decades, we have been providing these uh, goods and services at prices below cost. And that made the government spend much more than what it earned and our our expenditure far exceeded uh, the revenues and we have been giving high sugar actually uh, to the economy knowing very well that at some point we will be uh, 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 suffering from diabetes and all governments in the past what they did was basically knowing very well that the patient will be suffering from diabetes they were uh, the patient was given high sugar and they always thought that the next government will give the medicine and none of them gave the medicine so now we have come to a point where we are suffering from severe diabetes and even insulin cannot uh, cure the problem so now it is time to make structural adjustments and these structural adjustments are going to be very painful now we can see the pains already because the government uh, is left with no option but to, to increase prices of all products offered by the government uh, entities. I mean, education, there will be a, a price for education, there will be a price of health, and then already electricity prices are going to go up. I mean, they have already, uh, they are already discussing uh, the issue. Uh, gas, water, everything will go up in price. And what we have been, what, what we have to achieve right now is to create through this uh, 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 managerial and societal costing uh, framework awareness among the public that they need to know, they need to understand the cost at which these goods and services are produced. Because as Professor uh, alluded, in Sri Lanka, one of the biggest problems we have is people think government money is not their money. That is one of the fundamental problems we have in this country because people of this country think the government money is not our money. And when the government loses money, people don't think that they are losing our money. That is why there is less awareness, minimal awareness uh, and minimal interest in the, uh, in the cost incurred by the government in producing goods and services.
and also that is why people are not really uh, 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 making enough uh, outcry when the public money goes waste because people think the government money means government money it is not our money so what what this framework will try to achieve to do is to create awareness among the public that these costs uh, cost of goods and services produced by the government is incurred not by the government but by the people of the country actually we are the people who pay for the, the cost and uh, cost of goods and services produced by the by the government so what we need to what we need to understand is that we should compel the government to to ensure that they put in place a proper proper mechanism and machinery so that all these government entities government run enterprises keep accurate costing records and they they feel accountable for the cost incurred by them to produce these goods and services without making this accountability uh, 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 a pivotal aspect of uh, managing public enterprises we will not be able to to achieve any economic growth in this country uh, 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 here after because the economy has fallen down to such a level that to come out of this uh, pit we need to make very very painful uh, structural reform so stepping stone to making the structural reforms bringing about the structural reforms is to create awareness among the public that we need to pay the economic price for the the, the products and services uh, we consume that is that is a very very important aspect uh, we need to understand and that is exactly what we need to drive home by introducing and publicizing and giving giving adequate attention to uh, managerial and costing uh, framework we have already published and there are after we will need to come up with the stand guidelines and also the standard so that the people will know that they are entitled to to know the cost at which the government is producing these cost, uh, uh, goods and services and the public uh, are entitled to know the waste stages incurred in producing these goods and services public are entitled to know if there is corruption and uh, and thieves or pilferages in uh, producing these goods and services and the public should be uh, uh, geared to make the people who waste government resources means our resources public resources uh, accountable and that is a very important aspect uh, of this whole thing and then uh, uh, what we have to understand is that in the current context this framework uh, is going to play a very very important role because at the moment let alone public sector even the private sector is struggling to uh, cope with escalating uh, costs across the board really exchange rate our, our value of the rupee is rapidly Uh, depreciating uh, weakening and uh, there is a severe foreign exchange crisis in the country and even the private sector is unable to to procure uh, goods and services they need to run their operation and the costs keep changing day by day uh, yesterday cost is irrelevant uh, today today you have a new cost tomorrow it will be a, 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 a totally different cost so we need to give ourselves to understand this changing uh, dynamic in the costing environment uh, in the economic environment so that we are uh, we are more aware as to the as to the uh, uh, the direction we should take in pricing our uh, products and services so actually we can discuss a lot about all this uh, in the panel discussion i don't want, i don't wish to take much of your time going deep into these uh, uh, issues but all what i wanted to say was that we have half with this framework for uh, managerial and societal costing uh, uh, societal costing and societal costing is going to play a very very pivotal role within the next 6 uh, months to probably Two to three years in this country, if we were to put this country back on track, and there actually we have a role as professionals and also educated people to go to the public and tell the public that any cost incurred by the government is incurred by us. 
any money wasted by the government is wasted by us and it is our money that is being wasted if it is wasted and if money is incurred to produce a good uh, uh, produce goods and services it is our money that is being used to, to produce these goods and services and we need to as a as professionals as educated people as civil society we need to put together a, a, a strong front to compel the government this government it could be this government or even a future government that uh, uh, that the government officials and also the politicians will be held accountable for for the losses they make uh, uh, in public funds and the, the losses they cause public uh, ink in uh, producing these goods and services so these remarks i wish to conclude and i am very happy to take up uh, whatever the questions that will come up uh, in the panel discussion thank you Adrian can't hear you. Can't hear. Adrian can't hear you. Can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Ah uh, yeah, okay, right. Okay. Thank you, Mahendra. Uh, now, without taking, since we are running short of time, I would like to ask uh, before going to Rohan, uh, before going to Mahendra's questions, because Rohan uh, needs to go out. So Rohan Maskorali is the, the own person from the uh, export rubber industry. So uh, uh, can I ask Rohan to uh, be the, uh, the questions I would like to throw to uh, Rohan is, what is the impact of foreign exchange uh, fluctuation on his uh, uh, costing and pricing of his products in the rubber industry? And what steps has the industry taken to increase efficiency and productivity to provide these goods and services at a reasonable price and how do you propose this uh, they can to get this government out of this debt situation and what are the steps the industry is taking to improve uh, imp uh, increase the exports so that uh, our uh, balance of trade can be, be uh, much better and how do you in, uh, intend to enforce this accountability governance I think. and uh, in the private I think, sector? I think some of those he can take in the second round. Maybe initially he can talk on the impact on the pricing. Costing, yes. Costing, yeah. yeah. Over yeah. to you, Rohan. You are there? Yeah, yeah, I'm there. Thank you, Adrian. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Yeah. So, sorry, I'm on a power cut, so I'm on a backup power system, so it may not be very clear in the screen. Um, first of all, I think this... Uh, sudden shocks to any industry. Uh, most of people would say exporters are well off with the depreciation. Uh, but sudden shocks to any industry is a, not a good sign. Uh, and uh, our position was with the government for the last one year is to go, was to go to IMF. Uh, and we had several rounds of meetings with the Minister of Finance, but they were not, you, you would see that the contradictory remarks between the central bank and various government institutions and politicians say so end of the day what happened has happened and today we have seen uh, the dollar reaching nearly 300 rupees uh, at the banks uh, now one would say exporters are well off in our case uh, it's a different situation we look at it uh, on a long-term stability in terms of pricing now uh, we are in a global competitive market now sri lanka is known as a rubber exporter and we reached about 1.2 billion dollars of exports, uh, which was the highest uh, last year. Now, our value addition is about 65%. We rely on uh, raw materials uh, and chemicals and other products, steel, etc., to be imported. So, there's a basket of import also, which most of us manage it through uh, the dollars just like the apparel industry dollars we earn we use it for import purposes therefore right uh, our members have uh, indicated that at the moment they are holding on to dollar prices uh, but uh, we are seeing a situation of hypo inflation developing in this country which is very worrying that would be the exporters wherever they are because uh, already i saw professor stephen hawking or professor professor stephen from i can't remember his spelling he tweeted today that his calculations are uh, Steve Hanke from uh, 
uh, U.S. University, uh, John Hopkins, saying Sri Lanka's inflation, according to his calculation, is 49% year on year. Um, so you see, we are heading towards that side, even without the electricity prices and other prices uh, not yet announced. And with the dollar further depreciating, to be depreciating against the dollar, we don't know what the fuel prices and other prices are going to be in the next month. Uh, given this situation, we also have a situation where we buy the rubber, it's the main component, natural rubber from the trees for various products, gloves to rubber uh, tires. Now there are two segments here. There is a local manufacturing segment of local products, of rubber, uh, and we, we compete in the international market where we have to compete with other countries for the products. Uh, now, in locally, we see the local rubber prices are much higher than uh, much higher than the international prices because local product producers who are uh, offering higher prices to get the available rubber in Sri Lanka. So Sri Lanka's rubber productivity has come down by about 50% over the last two decades. Uh, and uh, as a result, although exports have been going up, uh, we have been increasing more net importing more natural rubber from Thailand and other parts of the world uh, to uh, fill up the gap. So what we see also, we also help intermediary companies uh, to provide various uh, products to our sector. Uh, now they depend on imports uh, and they don't have dollars. So their costs are also going up. So it means the local intermediary suppliers costs are also going up for our export industry which means uh, on one hand, what we see is if the current trends continue, the local value addition component can drop from 65% to 55% or 50% uh, in the medium term. And that is not going to help our exporters or their profitability uh, because the value addition keeps coming down means uh, their margins are going to go down uh, and they cannot just keep on price increasing because they are contracted for three, six, eight, 12 months, sometimes uh, that's the level of contractual obligations. So one thing we have seen is we have warned government if, if the conducive environment is not created for any industry, uh, whether it is rubber or apparel or any other major, what they're going to do is they're going to move out with technology and skills to more favorable locations. I mean, I can, it is black factual, everybody has seen some of our glove manufacturers have gone and set up operations in Oman. Uh, uh, do the glove manufacturing. So, uh, if the local con in the environment, labor costs, which like the apparel, we are expecting labor costs to rise by about 20%. Uh, electricity, which is a very high component of rubber products, high, high level rubber product manufacturing needs uh, high cost of uh, high energy. So, if energy prices are going to climb, container transportation has increased by nearly 50%. Um, so, now we can see the spiral of costs coming to neutralize the rupee devaluation on the other side. So if we hit a hypo inflation, I do not know uh, the, the ability of uh, holding the current price to the international buyers. And that is where the problem starts in the competition level in the global market. And all our members are very concerned uh, about the current situation. And we just, we just didn't want this to happen, sudden shocks to the economy. and. Uh, Unfortunately, uh, the policy makers didn't listen, uh, listen to anybody, I would say. Uh, and, and finally, we have ended up today going down the hill. And we, we are also seeing definitely an interest rate hike coming up in the next month. Uh, so borrowings to SME sector and all that also is going to go up. Uh, so we are in a very confused era. I cannot say that what, what, uh, what is exactly going to happen, but certainly it's a big uh, challenge for competition, competitiveness, and profitability of any investor out of Sri Lanka uh, for products and services. And uh, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bit of a, I would say, actually a very sad situation. And we are talking about a billion dollar extra exports uh, out of Sri Lanka last year. If you compare the Hindu reports, India's exports have increased by about $75 billion. Uh, so we are not even comparing ourselves in the region in terms of growth. So the challenges for manufacturers, and we are talking it, and we are very serious. We are not happy about this sudden depreciation uh, because it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very short-term gain for exporters, but 
long term consequences as far as we see uh, can be very very damaging to our industry and overall i think for the export industry okay rohan thank you very much uh, uh, can we ask uh, mahendra or to you mahendra how you are managing this cost impact on your industry and uh, and what measures has the tile industry taken to reduce the cost and uh, to make it a more profitable and viable one over to you mahendra see as far as cost reduction programs are concerned irrespective of uh, what is going on in the country the industry uh, uh, has taken a lot of steps over the last 2 uh, 3 years because energy uh, being uh, the main component of cost of uh, production in the ceramic industry accounting for uh, nearly 40% of cost of production uh, the industry has been really focusing on making the industry energy efficient by infusing new technology uh, uh, and uh, even uh, innovative uh, uh, methods uh, on the use of uh, energy but then uh, apart from that Uh, what you have to understand is that the uh, ceramic industry is also a importer of uh, uh, importer of uh, raw materials uh, uh, in big values uh, in form in the form of uh, glaze materials and other chemicals so uh, i mean whatever whatever uh, waste uh, is basically adding to cost of production and we as a industry uh, have been working uh, very uh, hard on uh, on achieving better Uh, the production processes uh, to 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 improve our uh, efficiencies and also reduce cost of production now one of the the, the initiatives we undertook uh, as a, as a company uh, was to to introduce uh, uh, you know uh, all these best management practices like uh, like tpm actually this year this, this year we were planning to challenge uh jipm uh, international award and we had gone to that extent in uh, implementing total uh, productive management uh, in our company so those things have brought us a lot of savings and improved our efficiencies and that is one reason why we have been able to uh, increase our profitability uh, over the last 2 3 years but then uh, managing the cost push uh, inflation Uh, uh, is a is a very hard task, uh, Adrian, uh, because this is completely out of our control. And what we are seeing is not fluctuation of the rupee, but constant depreciation, free fall of the value of the rupee. So that's why in my initial remarks also I uh, referred to you know cost inflation. Uh, you know, uh, uh, going up every day, seeing uh, I mean escalating uh, inflation, spiraling inflation. I would call it. uh we are seeing over the last 2 3 months and that is uh, putting a lot of uh, uh, pressure on the entire industry now weak weak exchange or weak currency is definitely a benefit to the exporter but here what we are talking in sri lanka is not a weak currency constant weakening currency which reduce inflows uh, into the country and that makes foreign exchange scarcely available in the market so as a industry we are not in a position to even import raw materials to continue with our uh, production operations now about two weeks ago we had a situation where we were not sure whether we would be able to to buy lpg uh, for this month's production and that is how scary uh, it has become now when a, when there is a situation like that that you are do safe how much you try to control cost you can control uh, uh, your production process and energy uh, efficiency so i mean what we need is basically uh, to to achieve uh, even cost consciousness in the organization there should be certain amount of stability in the organization without having stability in the organization uh, we cannot uh, achieve cost uh, efficiencies or even drive cost consciousness uh, among the staff because when the external environment becomes volatile internal environment also becomes volatile really. so while we continue with our cost saving practices we need to 
uh, engage in a day to day struggle to make sure that whatever the raw material we need for the production process comes in time uh, to the factory whatever the other material like uh, even energy lpg uh, is delivered to the factory on a daily basis because for your information uh, lanka tai's group is sri lanka's largest uh, gas consumer we consume uh, 1700 metric tons a month and our total bill is nearly 600 million rupees a month uh, on lpg so when there is uncertainty uh, arising from uh, foreign exchange markets <coughs> with regard to supply of raw materials we are in a helpless situation so how we are trying to manage it now we have to unfortunately try and source foreign exchange from wherever it is available that means basically we have been paying much uh, you know rates much above the market uh, published rates to 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 buy dollars and that is basically you know uh, taking our cost of production at a to a you know very different level and we are unable to forecast our uh, cost of production and uh, and and we are in a you know very precarious position when it comes to pricing decisions also because what we produce today we don't know at what price we need to sell because whether that selling price the product will fit may not be enough to buy the raw materials tomorrow or else so i mean that has been the situation we have been uh, seeing in the recent past i mean say uh, in the last three weeks i think uh, uh, dollar uh, to rupee parity has uh, gone up from uh, in the in the market 250 rupees to nearly 340 rupees today so when you have a escalating uh, 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 cost situation in the country the, the companies cannot escape and uh, that that makes us even internationally uh, unviable uh, adrian because we get calls from our buyers asking whether we will have carton uh, carton to pack our products for export because that is how unsure uh, even our uh, overseas buyers are so this whole thing has caused lot of turbulence uh, inside the country in the economy and that turbulence has invariably uh, come into the companies and the companies are really struggling to to cope with this situation i hope i answered your question but at a slightly macro level yes yes thank you mahendra uh, next i will call i will like ask mr jayasekara you are there mr jayasekara yeah i am there okay mr jayasekara now you are the chairman of state printing corporation and you are a council member of cma sri lanka also so mr jayasekara can you tell me now there was a query there was some articles regarding exam papers no you are not able to print and all that yeah. so how is the state printing corporation handling this paper business <laughs> yeah so what do you say uh, thank you very much uh, uh, inviting me to discuss these issues uh, actually speaking uh, before we get on to the topic i would like to talk few words about the environment which how this business is uh, activated now actually speaking printing industry is a very different industry because we all our 100% material requirements are imported items all 100% that means there is no local production at all for example now we are the printers for the nation that mean the state printing corporation established four years ago to provide all the printing requirements of the government for example textbooks to the government school 4.5 million school children their school books are printed by us in addition to that lotteries national lotteries board many items are printed by us then the uh, most of the annual reports of various public sector organization printed by us then exercise books that is also for school children printed by us in addition to that uh, uh, various licenses and various security printing also done by us now uh, this industry main item is 
if you take the raw material main item is paper for example printing papers writing papers uh, papers required for printing newspapers and the boards and duplicating papers etc now this country we import i am not only for the printing corporation entire printing industry about 350000 to 400 400000 metric tons we normally import that means we spend the country spend 350 million us dollars then uh, second important material is plates printing unit plates normally 3 million plates are imported for the printing industry in the country 6.2 million us dollars then ink ink of course again another 300000 metric ton imported they are uh, 1 million us dollars and in addition to that glue stitching stitching wire chemicals and all these requirements are important so that means 100% of the material requirement is important because you know we have not started manufacturing any of these things in the country now uh, the problem is the buying prices that means the due to the uh, Uh, foreign exchange fluctuation for, for the shortage of foreign exchange so these prices have gone up unexpectedly as mahendra said spiral by spiral inflation that means now for example i can give one example we wanted to buy some ink day before yesterday we got a quotation and we ordered and the, the, they gave us a price so we have written the check with the check we have send one vehicle to buy that then the uh, supplier said no that was yesterday's price today price is increased by another 30000 so he has written the check then again we have to call for uh, quotation because you can't buy so that uh, this problem is there that mean day by day these prices are increasing uh, due to Uh, for in exchange now say floating of this uh, us dollar now it has come to 300 almost 300 rupees now so uh, last month when we started uh, last month it was at the 2 240 now it has come to 300 so day by day these prices are increasing and our uh, we do a job costing specific order costing and normal costing so for all these things the biggest component is material 100% materials are imported so the price increases cannot unbearable and another important aspect the value addition is our part is labor labor and overhead that part is uh, limited to one fourth uh, that means the uh, nearly uh, 6 to 70% of uh, uh, the total cost is reflected with the material cost Uh, the printing industry uh, few areas are affected for example uh, uh, now this labor now we, we when we can't produce when we we can't produce even then we'll have to pay laborers because we can't keep them because they are just idling and so uh, because of that we have to buy these materials from the local market sometimes if it, because the local Uh, suppliers they also have increased their prices day by day because now some of them have imported items those imported items are uh, blocked at the uh, harbor that that level and the demerages and other thing they added down to the existing stocks because that that those stocks are not related to that the new new imported item but demerages cost they try to recover from the existing item that they have already uh, stored in their stores so as a result of it day by day these are uh, these prices uh, are increasing uh, another thing is uh, some of our printers print and export certain items are printed and export now the problem is 
when our price, the, the material prices are very high, their profit margin has gone down and uh, uh, they also can't give a sort of uh, permanent offer. For example, uh, when we uh, give a quotation today, uh, tomorrow we can't go and change this. So that means in short, uh, entire printing industry is badly affected. But I must say that uh, we are duty conscious people. Now, under, in, under any circumstances, we have to provide for examination purpose, the answers, answer papers, like, you know, the writing papers to be supplied. Uh, we can't delay. Then the school textbooks. Now, for example, um, by 1st May, we, are, we have to supply uh, entire school books because the government is planning to introduce a module system. Uh, uh, so that we'll have to provide these things. Uh, then again, exercise books. We have to manufacture exercise books because uh, in addition to the textbooks, we'll have to provide exercise books also. So we are the major supplier. Uh, that is also badly affected. Then uh, what we decided now, after uh, I have initiated a new project because uh, uh, when the US dollars, we can't uh, do these transactions so that uh, uh, with greater difficulty, uh, I was able to include uh, our paper supply, that means entire paper supply, uh, paper and related item supply that is connected to the Indian credit line. So that the recently the Honorable Minister has gone to India. Uh, originally, they were talking about medicine and various other items, but I told that because school children will be badly affected and uh, this industry will be badly affected, please make sure that it is included. Now it is included. And now what we are going to do is uh, we have to uh, pay uh, in rupee terms, but the payment will be done in the Indian rupees uh, without involving US dollars. Uh, that's how we have uh, made the arrangement to mitigate the situation. Uh, another important aspect I must say, uh, this industry uh, now, uh, uh, these school books, uh, these are pre-issues to the school children. That means the cost to the government. So my suggestion is now to face this challenge, we have to manufacture uh, at least papers required for printing industry. So I have already discussed with the uh, uh, paper company, state paper company, so that uh, only thing uh, they are also not, uh, uh, not yet ready, but we will have to produce and uh, use, but th that is our long-term plan. Uh, basically, uh, now our material cost comes to about uh, uh, 60 to 70 percent. So uh, labor cost is the second um, basic uh, uh, cost element and uh, profit margin will have to make it very low now because overweight cost is also there. Another thing that regarding the state printing cooperation, I must say that we don't take one cent from the treasury. We use our funds, our resources to produce things and give it to the government. Government pay us their agreed prices so that uh, we don't uh, take anything from the, uh, the government treasury uh, because this is uh, self finance uh, cooperation in Sri Lanka. So that also I must mention, uh, at the moment, we are facing uh, problems because we can't uh, make any profits because uh, labor cost is fixed, material cost is increasing day by day, and uh, overhead cost, of course, you all know that it is uh, a fixed cost, and labor cost is also fixed cost. Material cost is increasing, uh, very difficult to maintain the profitability. But anyway, we will try to manage and uh, implement some uh, cost reduction schemes, but it will take little time. Thank you. Thank you, Jayasekhar. Jay, uh, 
thank you very much. And it's nice to hear that uh, state printing corporation is not uh, borrowing money, asking money from the treasury. So, so one, at least we can see some institutions are doing on managing on their own. Well done. Uh, next, I would like to ask Mahanil. Uh, he's from the healthcare industry, the chief operating officer of uh, Durden's Hospital. Mahanil, you are there? Yes. Hi. Hi. Ed. Hi. Manil, uh, you know, healthcare industry is a very, very important industry, especially the private sector healthcare. Yeah. And it, there's a lot of implications and ramifications when you increase the pricing. And I know the uh, bulk of power, I would say 80 to 90% of the stuff is from, uh, except the doctors and all those things are important when it comes to raw material. So, uh, you know, because there's a big sector, very important sector also, uh, there's a social impact. Uh, how do you all plan to do this? I mean, uh, when, when when these prices start escalating, I mean, the people's lives are at stake. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. Uh, and good evening to all. Uh, yes, uh, as you correctly said, Adrian, the, uh, everything, uh, or I would say majority of the items which uh, is uh, taken in are imported. The equipment, the instruments, the consumables, the pharmaceuticals, all that are imported. So definitely there is a, a very uh, large impact uh, when we consider uh, healthcare that we, when, when uh, the fluctuation of the for, uh, ex foreign exchange, it directly hits us. Uh, of course, as you uh, said again, uh, we, even though we, uh, we see that we, we cannot just pass it on to the consumer because the reason being uh, the area uh, is uh, sensitive. We, we need to be more, uh, even though we are running a business, we need to be more humane and we need to look at the human aspect of it. Because many of the people who come uh, for the, uh, to obtain services sometimes uh, have an issue in affordability. So uh, even though now, if you really look at the exchange, uh, increase in the exchange, uh, and the suppliers increasing the prices, they have, that's we're talking about 30 to 40% increase in price for all of the suppliers. But we are unable to pass that on directly in one go. So maybe we will look at a certain percentage increase to bear, bear the cost increase. And maybe at a later stage, and also we, we are looking, uh, thinking favorably that the fluctuations will uh, in about three to six months time get more stabilized. And then uh, we might be able to look at the asset now, as most of the panelists said, it's very, uh, uh, you are not very sure at uh, what levels it will uh, rise because it has gone up to about 295, the dollar rate. So suddenly it, uh, it, it can even probably go up to 300 and even more. Uh, still it gets stabilized. So we will, we will look at, uh, uh, obviously it is going to have an impact in the business. Uh, but we, what we are trying to do is we will have to take a hit. The, the individual uh, organizations will have to take a hit. And then uh, we will have to see what, what will be uh, palatable to the uh, patients, the customers, and then pass it on uh, without uh, making them uh, uh, feel, feel the effect. Yeah, because we know in all other areas, uh, the price controls have been lifted. There are no price controls existing. Even if you take the bottle of water, the price controls have been lifted. But uh, in the uh, healthcare industry, still there are about four uh, or five items uh, that has been under price control. And we have still maintained that and we are going ahead with that those control prices. But it's a challenge with this increase in uh, the dollar. Uh, it definitely raw materials prices going up the reagent price is going up, it's really a challenge. So uh, we will have to manage it and we will of course have to lobby as well because we have the private hospital association as a, as a association that we lobby on these things. And when it comes to laboratory, which is another area uh, where investigations take place, uh, there are also we lobby through the private laboratory, medical laboratory association. So this way we, we try to uh, try to lobby with the government and the officials and try to get the best deal for the patient. Uh, but uh, it's a challenging time and we need to uh, see how, how we can uh, improve 
improve in our processors. That is another area which we are looking at in, inwards. By looking at outwards, we are looking inwards to see how we can uh, sort of uh, stop uh, waste stages and see whether we can improve. And another area with this increase in the dollar and all, all uh, it's, a, it's a very uh, huge challenge with regard to the uh, human resources as well. Because uh, as you know, we are a service-based organization. So people matter more than the buildings and the equipment. So, and uh, it is very, very challenging to keep people with the present economic situation. So again, uh, looking at their remuneration, all that needs to be considered. Now, there you see when the cost goes up, income uh, uh, or the contribution from the, uh, from the particular areas will be less, but then we have to meet the uh, target of uh, uh, looking after the employees as well. And also on the other hand, the shareholder is not going to be silent as well. So we need to look after the shareholders' interest as well. So uh, it's it's a quite a challenging time. But I think I'm sure that uh, if we it's a matter of a few months. I think if we hold on and make take strategic initiatives uh, to to uh, move uh, into areas that we can raise more foreign currency coming to this country. Uh, I would elaborate this more on uh, in the next uh, question, but I just would want to say, looking at medical tourism, that is an area which has got neglected, even though a lot of people have been talking about it, that area has got neglected. But when you look at the world scenarios, it's a huge area where we have uh, as Sri Lanka being a country who, who can also do very well in tourism. Can, this could be a good marriage between healthcare and uh, the tourism industry and, and uh, bring about uh, a lot of foreign uh, exchange to the country. So this is another area which we are hoping to uh, propose through the associations to see how best we can get this uh, going. Then uh, with regard to, uh, also I need to emphasize the, uh, the fact of the healthcare in the public sector being free. So that, of course, uh, there are two sides to the coin. One thing is a challenge to the government to maintain free healthcare at this particular juncture because they also are importing uh, pharmaceuticals as well as uh, uh, reagents for laboratory tests and so many other consumables. So, what, what again, we what we are thinking of it, we, what was discussed uh, maybe about two, two or three years back, is a public-private uh, partnership. But there we can look at the more affordable uh, because we see when you look at the, uh, the the expenditure now if you look at the private sector versus the public sector the expenditure uh, is uh, very much higher for the same particular service we, we in the private sector the costs are managed uh, much better so you can even look at uh, if you look at the human resource aspect uh, each uh, hospital uh, government hospital versus private hospital, the number of people are much more in a uh, government hospital. So uh, apart from that, to manage it and run it at a uh, at an efficient level, it, it would be a good thing to look at a public-private partnership with uh, the pet sector so that we can look at now, if you uh, just to give an example, if you take cardiac surgery, there's a long waiting list in the, uh, the cardiology unit in the national hospital. But there are excess capacity in the private sector. So uh, the same consultants uh, work in both areas. So it can be made use uh, to offer the similar service, even if the government pays that amount to the private sector, it's still worth it rather than they incur the overheads and the expenditure they're incurring now to maintain those huge uh, operations. So this is another area which we can look at because uh, presently, the public sector is catering to about 50, uh, plus, slightly above 50% of the inpatients. So that's a huge cost where, where if you take the OPD, uh, OPD it's about five, five to 10% people who go to the government sector OPD. The OPD uh, share, the market share is very much higher in the private sector. But if you take the inpatients, which is the cost is higher, 50, above 50% is handled by the government sector or the public hospital. So this again is a burden on the government, 
and uh, definitely this will impact on, on their uh, because the the efficiency levels are less so if we uh, i think as i suggested the public uh, private partnership if that is executed that can move forward but uh, looking as a country i think we have to go out there bring uh, bring uh, the people the whoever you know, the, there are countries uh, who are flourishing in medical tourism and our country is such a beautiful country with uh, so many things that can attract tourists so we need to actually go sell and get these uh, people and also to emphasize the 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 human capital we have the clinicians i mean if you take uh, uh, countries like singapore uh, then uh, in malaysia our clinicians are well up to that standard and i would say some, in cases some cases which have been refused from other countries that we have performed here and then so so we, we have the strengths that the good, good news is we have the strengths i think we should move forward and, uh, and get get this uh, project going so that that will bring in more to the country thank you mahanian thank you very much uh, uh, i would like to next call upon uh, pishan uh, uh, nalin are you there i'm here i'm here okay nalin uh, nalin is a ceo of uh, silon biscuits which is a very competitive industry and uh, and i think you all export also the industry both export a lot and uh, so uh, nalin can you give your view how you all are planning to face this issue with the cost increase and how to manage that one and how the industry what the industry is doing i, I lost you can you tell us how uh, the, the impact of this foreign exchange fluctuation on the industry and especially your industry uh -huh. sector and what actions you all are taking for some reason you. i lost you can you hear me hello nalin nalin you are frozen okay can we take uh, uh, i don't know nalin. what is he seems to be having yeah. a power cut i think no? yeah krishna oh, can you hear me Ah yes yes okay Ali. something when i was perfect up to now something went wrong so i relocated myself in the house uh i will switch off my video okay and i so, try uh, talking through uh, uh, through the audio only is that okay yeah that, that's fine and Nalin, could you repeat what you told me i missed some part of it okay i we would like to know how the your industry this foreign exchange uh, volatility has impacted your industry on the pricing of your products and what measures you all are taking to improve the productivity and exports of this uh, of your products industry products okay so thank you very much uh, professor for inviting me uh, so i will wear two hats one is the one hat is talking about the confection industry in general and talk about cbl in specific uh, so if you take the confection industry uh it has uh, from a cottage industry to uh, a large scale manufacturers are there in this country and today the confection industry is self sufficient and we can compete with anyone in the world today so much so if you look at the uh, the biscuits we serve today some of the biscuits have been served in international airlines purely because of the ability to compete in the quality and and the price points so when it came to uh, raw materials as most of the industry uh, the import component is quite high and the covid showed us if you are highly import dependent you got to get your logistics close to your manufacturing therefore we also looked at how we can make sure that certain amount of raw materials can be home grown or produced in sri lanka unfortunately the policy makers of this country keep on changing the policies therefore that it was absolutely challenging to pursue the path we want to pursue therefore uh, we have to yet continue to uh, be on uh, import dependent as all have you all said and experience the price fluctuations have been so erratic you cannot plan for a half a day even today and confectionery is being 
cut across across the socioeconomic class from the lowest uh, price to the highest price point, when the costs increase, it is not possible to pass on all the cost increases to the consumer. Therefore, a certain amount of cost has to be absorbed by the company. We as an industry or we as a company to be specific has invested a lot of money on automation, robotics to ensure that the efficiencies are maximized. Therefore, the only way we can, not the only way, one of the most important aspects of managing cost is to reduce your uh, raw material and packing material costs. We also have an export component where we compete with the large scale manufacturers from Asia, China, and especially from Vietnam, Thailand in the confection industry. Therefore, when the cost increases, passing the cost for international customers is impossible. We got to have good reasons. Therefore, today, we as a company, uh, in we were talking about costing, we looked at marginal costing as a, a key component in managing our price points. But yet again, when it comes to the raw material prices, it's absolutely chaotic. And we are not in a position to pass on to this consumer. What are the options do we have? A, are we looking at different manufacturing sites, not only Sri Lanka or the country? Yes, we are evaluating. We have a manufacturing in Ghana, Bangladesh. We are looking at India very specifically. But I must say, if you are not strong in your home country, until you become big internationally, to get economies of scale, you got to have a strong local base. Now, the challenge for the industry is that with these cost increases, the local bases have been challenged. We are been not a competitive country anymore in terms of manufacturing to compete with the international brands. Therefore, what, the, what we have to do is that how to ensure that we can compete internationally. But is, as of today, it's mere impossible. So that's kind of a small introduction of the industry and we how we are managing cost. Today, cost management is out of control. Thank you, Nalin. Uh, next, can we ask uh, Krish uh, Krishna Ravindran? Krishna? Yeah, hi, hi. Hi, uh, hi, Krishna. Uh, yeah. Uh, can I call you Krishna? Is it okay? Yes. Yes. Yeah, Krishna. Thanks, Krishna. Uh, Krishna, you are the executive director of Printcare. Now we had Jai on the printing industry as a whole. I think that's on the state sector. So you are on the private sector side. Can you tell me uh, how your industry on the private sector side, how you are managing this volatility and what measures you are taking to reduce the, the cost, uh, in, uh, how improve the service and reduce the cost, what you have Sure, so I think Mr. Jayasekhar gave a good overview. So I, I'll I'll uh, I'll I'll add two things to what he said. Um, the first is uh, you know the printing industry, although he touched on it, I think he didn't go into detail. So I can I can expand on that. Uh, this is our kind of second shot at this rodeo. You know, we last year we had huge spikes in raw materials, uh, primarily paper, but also inks uh, uh, as a primarily as a function of COVID-related disruptions. Uh, and so, you know, this 30% increases, this is not new to us. Sadly, this is the second time we're having to deal with this. Um, so, so, you know, we're quite, you know, the, we, we put in place quite a bit of strategies last year. Uh, and I feel sorry for the industry because just as we are getting to grips with that, now we have to deal with uh, this, you know, the, this massive depreciation uh, or devaluation, probably a uh, better word. Um, so, so we've really been, you know, we've had a chance to focus over the last 12 months on productivity improvements, efficiency improvements. Uh, and the thing is, you know, waste reduction or all the things that, you know, the speakers have been talking about. Um, you know, the, the problem is that helps when you've got to deal with 10%, 15%, you know, you, you can do something with wastage, with productivity. Uh, but generally, when you have 30, 40% spikes, uh, you know, it's there's not much you can do in in your know, three months or six months in terms of productivity waste reduction. You know, so you're really 
uh, you're really having to think outside the box. So a lot of what we did last year was you know sit down with our customers and and kind of re-strategize their whole uh, portfolio of, of how they want to um, you know address this problem. You know we we didn't talk about five percent reduction, ten percent reduction because we're talking about forty percent increase in costs. Uh, so really, it was kind of a collaborative approach that we took with our customers to say, look, if if you do not want to pay these prices, we've got to work together to come up with uh, certain. Uh, you know, uh, not compromise is not the right word, but relook at your packaging design, relook at the way your your portfolios, your packaging portfolios have been set up, uh, and maybe we can question a lot of the assumptions you've made. You know, maybe a a certain size we can relook at, uh, maybe a certain thickness of board we can relook at. So, so we really were forced last year out of you know pure uh, of of necessity to to kind of start thinking outside the box, and that really helped us quite a bit. So. With the efficiencies and waste reduction programs, uh, we we managed to get you know five ten percent down, and then really in in a lot of cases by uh, substituting certain material or changing the design of the packaging, we were able to uh, take out a lot of lot of waste uh, that we didn't even realize was there. You know, and, and a lot of that is based on these old assumptions that have come over the last ten years. Uh, so, so you know, just as we were getting over that, now we've got hit with uh, with this other increase. So. You know how much space we have to to maneuver again. Uh, you know, I'm not sure, but I think the the playbook is in place now. We just have to reapproach the playbook uh, and see, you know, how what further we can do. What are the what are the changes we can make? Uh, and so those are the kind of conversations we are having at the moment with our customers. Uh, and and that's it's a continuation of conversation we've been having now for the last 12 months, sadly. Um, so so that's I think the first thing I'd like to add. The second thing, of course, is uh, one big difference is we are also quite a large exporter and indirect exporter. So, you know, 60 odd percent of our, our revenue, 60, 70 percent come from uh, we get in foreign currency. So we haven't had the same type of challenges. Uh, I, I assume that the rest of the uh, a lot of the other parts of the industry have had. Uh, but we've had different challenges. Uh, for example, as I think Mr. Mahendra Jasekar was saying, uh, uh, the local component costs have been slowly rising because uh, a lot of our suppliers have had to source their dollars. Um, you know, from uh, from other other sectors, and so those costs have been rising. And up to now, we haven't been able to gain that because we converted used to convert at two hundred and three. Um, so now, I think with the with the devaluation, uh, a, a key strategy of ours is how can we uh, now that the costs have right sized, can we go out there and look for more business? Uh, and and maybe you know further at the next question, I can go into that in more detail on. You know, kind of what are the strategies that we're using, uh, you know, to, to to try and attract more business to Sri Lanka, and there are really two key segments we can look at. Uh, so, Adrian, I don't know if you want me to touch on that now or, or wait. Uh, I, I'm sorry, you're on mute. Go ahead. Please go ahead. Uh, you can take on that one now. Yeah, yeah. So, so I think you know, Sri Lanka. Uh, you know, I, 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 we've been talking about all the the bad. Things that have been happening and and probably will continue to happen. Uh, but I think we, you know, to, to to look on the positive side, there are two key, uh, especially with printing and packaging, there are two key advantages this country has had. Uh, first, location. You know, we're we're in a great uh, strategic location between the east and the west, uh, and that gives us a great opportunity to link into many value chains. Um, you know, if you look around us, within two weeks of sailing, uh, as long as we can continue to keep our, our ships coming to our port. Uh, you know, we've got 3 billion people um, and, you know, there is a, a great opportunity here to link into a lot of those value chains as long as, you know, we are competing on even terms, which in many cases we are not. Uh, and that's, you know, a discussion we're having with the EDB also to see how we can even those, those playing fields in terms of tariff barriers and non-tariff barriers. Uh, but that's a great opportunity that we have to kind of link into these value chains uh, and, and a huge population around us and all of them need some kind of packaging. Uh, for their for their day to day purchases, um, I think the second thing is really on sustainability. You know, it, uh, our, our print industry uh, is actually uh, quite far ahead in this. Uh, you know, we've got a good leadership in place, and we really should be. And this is a huge trend that is now. You know, uh, obviously everyone has has been reading about it, uh, and I think Sri Lanka has a great opportunity because a lot of the practices, uh, given our export base, a lot of the pra good practices are already built in into our, our systems, our processes, our culture. Uh, and so I think that's a great opportunity to, to really piggyback on this. And, and there are 
you know, the apparel industry, I think, in some ways has, has taken a lead on this. Uh, T is now trying to do it. So I, I think there's a, there's a great opportunity there for us to a, link into these value chains around us and, and address a very large market. Uh, and also, you know, uh, address this sustainability issue and figure out how we can uh, take advantage of that because we've really, uh, we're in a position where we can, we can, if you put a, I think the, the skill is there. The question is, is the will there and, and, the, and the backing? Uh, so I thought, you know, maybe a little bit of uh, cheer after, after the, the chat we've had for the last uh, 45 minutes. But, you know, I, I think there is, you know, uh, if you keep looking on the positive side, I think there is potential Although I, I agree with everyone who's gone before us, we're in an utter mess at the moment. Uh, but I think we've been in utter messes before and we've come out of it. So, so we've, you know, I, I think it's, it's important that we, we, all, we all put our heads together and come out of this. I think that the talent still exists, although it is fast migrating, but the talent still exists to get out of this. Thank you, Krishna. It's nice to see that you're very positive. Yes, I'm with you. We had to think out of the box to come out of it, I think. I think we all need that one. So next, I would like to call my friend Conrad. Conrad, you are into not only IT sector, you are into the financial services sector, and and we are heading. I do, you are LLC finance. You are heading for some time, and you are the financial services sector. It's highly dependent on the import industry, or the back end. I would say on the value chain, which is at the moment. I think it's. Uh, it's uh, no, everybody knows it's uh, imports have been restricted. So, uh, Conrad, uh, I'm going to ask you from both industries, how do you feel? You're on the IT side on, on one side, and you're also heading a finance company on the other side. Your light is not there. Are you going to power cut? Conrad? I think he... Conrad, can you hear me? Yes, uh, I can hear you, but I, the power went off, don't worry. I am, uh, <laughs> okay, okay, Conrad. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Let's cheer up. Is he going to uh, what, part what part of our life? It's going to be right. So okay. I'll, I'll, I have to switch off the uh, video. Sorry for sorry about it. it. Just now the power went off, so I have to. Uh, you have to wait until I uh, start my backup power. But anyway, I think uh, thank you, thank you, Professor, for inviting me as well as Adrian uh, for having me. And uh, first of all, I think before I uh, before I uh, talk about anything about the uh, two industries i just want to do uh, i think uh, just want to add few things to the previous conversations that we had so one of the main things is basically uh, if you really look at it i think as as business people we all know there are no free lunches right so i think we we uh, i think we are now uh, enjoying the repercussions of the free lunches i think this was mentioned by mahendra very well uh, basically, we have, as Sri Lankans, we have been enjoying a lot of subsidies and a lot of things in the, in, the, in, the, in the past. So I think that's a repercussion that we are paying now. If you really look at it, in, even uh, for the last 70 year, uh, plus years, so everything or most of the things were sub subsidized. But what I want to articulate is uh, when we reach uh, the per capita GDP of a middle income country, we fail to identify these subsidies and then to remove them uh, or start removing them, right? Uh, uh, which you set the right expectation of the community and the people who are here uh, in the country. I mean, if you do that uh, to a certain extent, I think you would have been able to manage this situation. Uh, this is, uh, uh, I think, uh, this is, I, I think we all know that as businesses, we need to transform ourselves for external pressures and the technologies and various things. So I think we have failed to transform ourselves during the last so many years uh, in terms of identifying what needs to be done uh, in terms of the free launchers and uh, what needs to be what needs to be managed. So that's having said that, uh, Adrian, I think you, you put me in spot in two, two industries. So let me talk about the IT industry, uh, which from a more opportunity perspective, all right? So if you look at the IT industry, there are, I think there are three sectors that I, I think that uh, the organizations are faced with. One is the, uh, one as, an, as a consumer of IT, the IT is, I think everyone, I'm sure uh, every company here has used uh, the, the technology 
as uh, the key component in terms of transforming their businesses and increasing their efficiencies, which is vital in terms of today's context uh, to have the efficiency. So the, as a consumer of technology, uh, which I was as a CIO earlier, yeah. which uh, which we look at from a technology perspective, there's a huge issue that which we are trying to face. Uh, we, we are facing because um, I would say 90% of the technology is uh, important technology that we have, right? So that is a huge, huge impact will make not only to to a single industry, it will impact the financial services industry. It will uh, it will impact all the other industries who are on digital. And as you know, the COVID uh, always put us to be in the digital front and the digital technology adoption of digital digital. And that means that there is a certain amount of repercussions in terms of our uh, cost uh, in terms of as managing as organization. So that's that's as a consumer part of the technology from then the other uh, side of it is that actually uh, the technology companies who are here who are service providers or facilitators of technology they are facing the same uh, thing like importers and they, they have to import technology they have to they have to pay in dollars and they have to they have to supply in except just like the printing industry they have to import everything from a technology perspective most of the things and they have to sub give so there is a huge cost escalation and uh, in 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 terms of as consumers there is a almost 40 to 50 percent increase in in terms of the cost and as uh, facilitators of technology or, or the technology service providers they are having a huge impact in terms of uh, determining the price which is you know very difficult i think um, uh, Mr. Jaisekara, as well as uh, Krishan, and very, and even even uh, uh, Mahanil mentioned that you know it's very dicey situation with regards to you don't know when uh, what to what to the purchase order that you get now whether it's deliverable because they are your exposing dollars. So that's a huge uh, challenge that we have. Then I'd like to come to the more positive side of it in terms of the as creators of technology. As you know, the in Sri Lankan context, we, we uh, the the technology industry is almost about 1.2 1.5 billion industry in terms of export. However, uh, we uh, it will be uh, it will be a short lived thing if we don't act now. In my personal opinion as well because that industry is totally dependent on, there is no raw material required. The raw material is the people. And that's uh, that's what we have in Sri Lanka. And if you don't protect, protect them, and if you don't give them the right uh, uh, environment, I think they might, I'm sure that you would have faced in terms of the migration and they might leave this country. So that's something that we need to, we need to really, really protect. That's as an industry we need to do. Having uh, said that, there is another issue that which we we have to, which is a more of a macro issue, right? If you look at the IT industry, it's more IT the the creators of IT industry. It is more related to a more of a labor uh, services that which we provide as software developers or as an industry, uh, more similar to a BPO industry rather than. Uh, creating uh, intellectual property. So that environment from a macro level, I don't think it has created properly in this country. So which is very important uh, as, a, as, a, as the world move towards the digitization. Uh, if you look at the, if you look at some other more developed countries are uh, encouraging people to come. Uh, that's where the Sri Lankans are using Losing the, the, I mean, Sri Lankan people are migrating, right? Even as, I mean, I'm, I'm not that old, but I, I, at my age, I can migrate to a country uh, with my skills, uh, especially because of the technology skills, that I can migrate very easily to a country. And I have seen that happening in my companies, in which I'm managing in terms of the technology company, uh, not at a very young age, but the experienced people are taken with. Where who can create an intellectual property in those countries? So we we have to 
as a country, we need to develop that uh, the capacity as well as creating of intellectual property or the digital assets, right? Uh, pardon me for saying that. I think we have the industries here which are creating the physical goods uh, and exporting them. Certainly, it will have value. But if you really look at it from an apparel industry perspective or a printing industry perspective, and I think uh, Mr. Jayasekhar and everyone said there's a huge amount of imports that we need to do uh, uh, to sustain that industry. But if you look at the technology creation industry, if you really look at it, there is hardly any import. It's only the brain power that which is created in this country. And I think we should harness that brain power and harness just like the uh, the accountants in Sri Lanka who's giving a BPO industry, creating the BPO industry. So that's something that we need to really, uh, really understand. And how do we create a digital asset in, 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 the, in a country like Sri Lanka? Because we are a country which we don't have that much of natural resources, right? So, so if you don't have the natural resources, only valuable thing that we have is the brain power that we have created. And if you compare with the other countries who are providing BPO industries like the Philippines and India, which is purely uh, main, main, mainly uh, looking at the number of people who are there rather than the, the power that they have in terms of the brain power. Whereas the Sri Lankans uh, are very good at uh, uh, creating more advanced things, which is proven in terms of even in the BPO industry, more sophisticated BPO industry. And using that, we might have to look at creating the, the technology uh, intellectual property and the digital assets in this country. So I think uh, my request to those who are joined here as well as the, as, the, as the organizations who are here, probably we might have to look, give, uh, uh, give a chance to either uh, your organizations need to invest in those, uh, that sector as well as promote the Sri Lankan developed intellectual property or the technology to be adapted so that we can retain a lot in terms of the foreign exchange uh, that which is going out and probably you can you might be able to reduce your cost uh, as a, as a company as a country in terms of the the, the uh, products that you might have to use in terms of the technology i don't think that any industry can uh, ignore technology in going uh, going to the uh, next year so Adrian, you want me to touch on financial services also? Uh, Conrad, it's good you can start on that one also because you are the CEO of LOC Finance also. <laughs> what exactly you want me to? I mean, uh, how, uh, because you are, you are industry, uh, financial services, you are industry highly import oriented, right? Yeah. So your assets are, now it's, there's a restriction. So how do you think uh, the finance company sector is going to face this? No, I think certainly, I think it's it's a challenging time, right? So I think this has been debated, uh, not only, I think, uh, to take the financial services industry, it's very important for any, any economy, whether it's uh, banking, uh, banking and financial services. Certainly, uh, the industry which is um, represented in uh, basically the financial uh, institutes, uh, non-banking financial institutes, are purely dependent on uh, the assets which are more movable assets uh, predominantly than the immovable assets. Of course, they have, we have been innovated in going into immovable assets as well. So, uh, challenging time, the assets are valued at uh, exorbitant prices as well, and which is making it unaffordable to uh, the, the, the consumers. But I think what is important uh, in, in my view, in terms of the financial services industry, uh, entire industry needs to look at more or less from today, uh, from a cash flow perspective, rather than in terms of looking at from a uh, asset perspective, the assets are being very important, but we need to be there in uh, every sector, uh, supporting the SME to the the SME to the micro to the large scale companies as well. So uh, yes, uh, we are facing uh, the last two years, even the COVID has not impacted this much in my view, 
but i think the next year it's going next uh, this this financial year is going to be a very challenging year because the covid even though covid has impacted the businesses but there is a local economy running to a great a great extent now uh, in uh, what is happening is that it is impacting the local economy as well if you look at the local economy uh, whether it's, it's it's just a simple i'm i'm sure we know that you know due to various decisions that the political parties and the governments have taken has impacted the industries like the agricultural sector it has impacted the 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 various other sectors which has a ripple effect in terms of all the sectors so i think uh, uh, the every industry is facing even i think our topic today is mainly looking at what the impact on the dollar but uh, the more than that has impacted the, the local industry not because of the dollar the dollar uh, has impact dollar uh increase has impacted the raw materials as well as the diesel and the, and and the, i think uh, professor uh, touched upon the gas as well right so which is impacting the local economy in terms of the production in terms of the local economic activities which is which is certainly having a big impact on the financial services sector as well so uh we we uh, as i mentioned Uh, the financial services sector has invested a lot in terms of the technology the co banking applications and all that there is a huge increase in terms of the cost there is a huge increase still even though that we are saying that we, there is a lot of digitalization but there is so much of dependency on the piece, uh, the paper and the uh, piece of papers that which we do for agreement and everything so there is a short supply of that there is a lot of in, 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 uh, the cost increases in that um the segment so it's going to be a bit of a challenging time for financial services so uh, as an industry as an organization we are we are as an organization if you look at it uh, we are very cautious about uh, uh, in terms of what we do uh, but uh, fortunately as a group if you look at it we are well diversified into not only to in, uh, the we are well diversified into uh, multiple geographic geographies i would say that we are the uh, higher, most diversified geographically diversified organization that has given us plus points if you really look at it the dollar depreciation in sri lanka where sri lankan assets have gone down in 40% of price but uh, 40% of value whereas the international assets of ours has increased in 40% 40 to 50% in terms of the international assets so overall as a group um we are well poised however the sri lankan uh, uh, organizations have play uh, will face uh, bigger challenges i hope that i an answered the questions anything any specific thing that you want edwin i don't mind answering thank you conrad i think you give a very big uh, uh, a wide uh, area and you address the uh, address sorry i don't take more two industries in one go for you uh thank you very much we are actually running short of time uh, we have so the to for closing remarks i would like to we yeah, are almost there uh, hand it over to professor watawala professor watawala you, you have uh, any final you, comments uh, you can give everyone maybe the uh, be a short uh, one or two uh, one or two minutes for each one yeah so uh, uh, mahendran you have fun final mahendran you are there Yes, I'm here. Yeah. Okay, Mandan, can you give your uh, wrap up? What do you suggest is uh, at least in two sentences or three sentences? Uh, how do you suggest this? Uh, we the, as a country we get out of this. Over to you, Mandan. No, finally, uh, Adrian, we need to be pragmatic in our approach as a country as to how we are going to deal with this situation uh, because uh, the solutions are not uh, going to be easy. Solutions are. are going to be painstaking and we need to be ready to take that and the government should be in a position to <coughs> explain the true position uh, of the country and the economy uh, to the masses and and ready the masses to accept the truth and at the same time uh, the government also should be mindful of the fact that uh, 
they need to be exemplary uh, if the government is not going to be exemplary and the political leaders are not going to be exemplary uh, it will be difficult for them to go out to uh, uh, the society and tell the masses to sacrifice and uh, and uh, and pull this uh, i mean you know in short what i have to say is that uh, that uh, uh, this is going to be a very painful exercise and we need to take very painful measures but to take painful measures and to get the the support for the for the pain uh, for, for these painful measures to get the support of the public the government will have to act in exemplary manner if the government is not going to act in exemplary manner uh, then the public public is not going to support whatever the reforms they are going to uh, to bring forward so that, those are my closing remarks thank you mahendran mr jayasekhar over to you yes uh i agree with uh, many suggestions uh, my thinking if we had continued the local industry started uh, during 1956 uh, to 70 like flywood corporation tire corporation and uh, various uh, sri lankan industries we wouldn't have faced this type of situation today uh so at least now we must realize because you see now uh, we were depending uh, many things from other countries so that is the biggest problem that we face now uh and uh, second thing the if we take the printing industry they never thought the importance of this for example now school children they need books and uh, various other things right now for example uh, though the uh, technology is there we have to depend on papers to a certain extent uh, that is why we could have thought about these things long ago but even now now look at in sri lanka the waste stages we don't use it no we now for, for example uh, even exercise books used by the school children that can be collected converted into papers again and we can reuse these type of uh, things we we'll have to apply otherwise if we are going to depend uh, from uh, overseas suppliers i think we can't continue so this is my thinking but whatever it is state printing corporation corporation and with all the other printing industry people we are going to get together and uh, think about our future i think uh, the krishna will agree because there are a large number of people uh they are they get their salaries and perks from this industry so now all are facing biggest problems so we'll have to wait and see hope for the best what to do thank you jay uh, mahanil your comments yeah you there yes yes sir uh, yeah. over to you mahanil Yeah, thanks, Edwin. Edwin, I think uh, I I would agree with Professor Watavala what he said at the beginning. Uh, we we need to uh, take the matters to our hands. But private sector, it it is I think uh, uh, I don't think there's much we can expect looking at the past history of maybe seventy seventy five years. But what good can come out of it? How much efficiency we can improve is a question. But private sector has proven itself. and uh, running organizations in a sustainable manner so i think in each sector uh, we need to take that initiative uh, we we all of us have different associations of each uh, area and we need to lobby and get things going i think that's the only way because otherwise uh, if you let let it uh, run in the, to their own devices uh, the outcome would be what we see now so my my last comments would be to uh, to uh, get together and uh, make a difference uh, through the uh, private sector 
and as I mentioned in my uh, previous one, the if we can have a public-private partnership uh, where we can also be a partner to the uh, uh, public uh, domain, I think that will be the most uh, efficient thing that we could propose. Thank you. Thank you, Mahani. Uh, Krishna, over to you. Uh, yeah, I think you know my takeaway here, and again, trying to be a little bit on the on the positive side. Although I, I think there's very little reason to be positive, but uh, uh, Professor Watavala probably knows this. I think it's Churchill who said, "Never let a good crisis go to waste." Uh, I, think, I think we are we are definitely in a good crisis, uh, and you know we should really use this uh, to really whip ourselves and get us back on track. Uh, you know we can, as everyone has said, we there is a a, a certain level of pain we have to go through um, and as long as we get together and go through it i think uh, you know there, there is a chance that we will come out stronger um, and and you know this is uh, this is a chance for us to show that we can do this uh, if we get back into divisive politics as i've seen and and you know we all point fingers at each other then we are going to be stuck in this mess for the next i don't know how long so so again my, my takeaway here is you know i think professor watavali was churchill right who said uh, Never let a good crisis go to waste. And I, I always remember that. Even at, in work, when we're having tough times, I say bad times always le lead the groundwork for good for good things to happen. So let's focus on making those good things happen, whatever those may be. And I, I've seen, I've heard lots of good ideas here. Thank you, Krishna. Uh, Conrad, what to you, Conrad? Yeah, I think uh, my takeaway is uh, very simple. I think we have to collaborate uh, with every industry, every person as Sri Lankans and to see how we can come out of this. At, at, at the end of the day, uh, I think there is a lot of opportunities of uh, opportunities uh, with any crisis as uh, Krishna mentioned, right? So I think we need to see how we can uh, explore that, right? So I think uh, we need to be very positive. If you really look at it from, from a from an IT industry perspective, as I mentioned, there is a great opportunity uh, where we can create our own IP. I and mean, that would be one of the, the things that we need to do. So because Sri Lanka, we don't have that much of natural resources to so brag about in terms of uh, getting the foreign income. So we need to depend on certain other things. So that could be the technology, la technology labor or the intellectual property is one way and the other things that which we do. So we need to really, really get together as a, as a, not as one industry, but as a overall Sri Lankans and probably find out how to come out, how do we come out of this situation? So it's collaboration is the most important thing in my view in today's context uh, and ignore the politics, ignore the governments. I think the collaboration as individuals is the most important thing. Thank you, Conrad. Yes, sir, over to you, Professor. Uh, uh, Nalini is there, I think. No, Nalini. Yes. Nalini. Uh, Nalini. Okay, Adrian, for some reason or other, uh, you missed me, but nevertheless, uh, I got three particular points to communicate. One is that whatever said than done, Sri Lanka is a very small economy. It's an $80 billion economy. And if uh, a speedy recovery is possible, when the Asian crisis took place in 2008, Sri Lanka was the least if impacted because our, our SMEs held together. Of course, this time the SME has been affected, but nevertheless, the economy is small, can recover fast. Second thing is that there is huge opportunity in agriculture. Because if you take the uh, industry I work for, if we backward integrate, work with, with the farmers, we can quite a lot substitute what is imported. Third thing, just to add to some positive tones, Sri Lanka missed two great opportunities. The tsunami to change the course of the country, 2009, the end of war. I've been personally propagating to leading politicians saying then don't whine and grind. This is the greatest opportunity purely because people have got into a mindset that we need to do the most drastic, difficult uh, thing to in order to get out of this. If they go and say, we're going to restructure certain government institutions, we're going to redo this, people are in a slightly better mindset 
to accept drastic economic and policy changes. Don't miss this opportunity because today's mindset is much more different than what it was many years ago if they want to make economic impact. Thank you, Nalin. Over to you, Professor. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Adrian. I think I must uh, thank all our, uh, I think uh, Mahendra gave a very good speech and also the other panelists who spoke of their industry and uh, of course as to the problems they are facing and uh, how they can get over it. Uh, the main thing of course is the non-availability of uh, foreign exchange. Uh, we had this uh, prior to 77 but uh, we did not feel it because uh, we were not a debt burden country, you know. We have not taken loans. But unfortunately, uh, large loans have been taken. Uh, they have not given any returns. And we are still taking loans without knowing how we are going to repay. So that's the first thing. Now, like what you all said, that is the first thing that uh, we have to uh, to do and uh, see as to what action uh, that we are going to take to repay the loans. Of course, one will have to reschedule most of these. And I can't understand why everything is going to the foreign people, you know. Don't we have uh, good legal people here in Sri Lanka? You see, uh, the initial basic work has to be done by us. We know everything. Then Maybe for the finer points, we go to the foreign people, you know, our people forget all these things, you know, because we know our own country, we know what is there, we know what we can do. Now, we have a very good resource here. All these, uh, uh, those who are running the big companies, and uh, they are doing extremely well, and today they spoke extremely well, but uh, I can't see that... Uh, uh, to reschedule all these things, uh, we should go to the foreign people. Let us uh, do the initial groundwork. And then after that, if you think that uh, these have to need uh, sort of a, uh, uh, maybe a, a good uh, thinking has to be done, where new ideas could be done, then they will do it. You know, that's how uh, things have to work. But I, I think uh, uh, there is no uh, coordination. Now, yesterday, at this uh, all-party conference, we saw what was happening, where uh, they were talking of the IMF package, you know. I think this should be spoken in the parliament, you know. But uh, unfortunately, you have to have an all-party conference to do that, you know. So I don't know how uh, much confidence uh, or how the uh, private sector can really work with the government and give them this message, you know. I think chambers of commerce have to come out of, uh, I think they have they have uh, really uh, praised the Indian government, you know. It's good, the Indian government, but uh, uh, tell the local people how you are going to use that money and repay that loan, you know. That is what the private sector is not, uh, not to praise someone uh, for giving the loan, you know. So I think uh, uh, what you have given is very, very good uh, examples. You must tell your chambers of commerce to come out of this and tell the country, uh, tell the government what we can do to make this country, you know, that's what we need to uh, do. So if we can really do that, uh, we am sure that uh, we can uh, come over this problem that we are definitely having. And the most important thing, like what uh, Mahindra mentioned, the costing area, uh, cost is very important. Efficiency is uh, one that will flow from uh, the costing. Uh, the productivity is one that will flow from that. And, that's all, you know, because if you really look at what uh, uh, Lee Kuan knew, he said, pay one salary. That will include everything. All the ministers must start with that, you know, all government officials will start with that. Give a salary that will include all their transport, if their telephone, their uh, petrol and everything, and let them manage with that, you know. But today, uh, that is not happening, you know. They are getting a small salary and the other allowances are so high you can't do it, you know. So they must set an example. That was what was mentioned. If they want to win the confidence of the public, I think they need to set an example. So private sector has already done that. And I'm sure we should work how we uh, see how we can work with them. And all these ideas that have been done, I'm sure will certainly benefit uh, to come out of this very, very difficult uh, situation that we are. But we need to watch it. 
and see how we can contribute in order that it will not escalate any further because if it goes uh, further i think uh, we are all going to be in, in uh, great uh, trouble so i think we should be all aware of this uh, we should see uh, as to what the private sector do the private sector the chambers of commerce they all get together and see how we can overcome so once again let me uh, thank all of you for the very very uh, uh, the uh, various good ideas that you have given and let's see how we can how that will help and implementation of course is there with the private sector and i'm sure that they can uh, uh, maybe uh, withstand this uh, current situation but maybe uh, the government has to understand uh, what uh, can be done by the private sector and as to how uh, they will be able to solve the problem so uh, let me thank you once again and i'm sure that uh, all of you have uh, devoted your valuable time we had i think a uh, lot of the people who have registered i think about 400 but then with this power cut and uh, other problems that we have had it was not there but certainly a recording is available so we will make it available to everyone uh, so that they can go through the recording and listen to what you have said so once again let me thank uh, thank everyone and uh, wish you a very good night thank you and all the best thank you Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks all our families. Thank you. Okay. So we will uh, close up now. Thanks a lot, and we'll keep in touch. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Right. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Jay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you.